This is a, a certain situation which has happened many times in the world before. It's just that it's new for our generation and uh, as a generation of people, we are better equipped than any other generation before us. If we behave responsibly, we can uh, survive through this and live through this. Uh, Sadhguruji, thank you very much for being here today, sir. We are uh, extremely delighted and uh, uh, for the presence. Uh, and uh, we've got ex very good support from your team to make this happen, sir. I'd like to hand over the session to uh, Dr. D.K. Agarwal, our president of the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry for moderation. Uh, Sadhguruji, we are passing through a very unprecedented and a warlike situation of COVID-19. What as individuals, what as businesses, what as government, we should do so that these calamities do not occur again in future. Well, uh, this is a this is a pathway that a whole lot of people tend to take. That we are being punished by God, we are being punished by nature. No, we need to understand this. This is a, a certain situation which has happened many times in the world before. It's just that it's new for our generation. And uh, as a generation of people, we are better equipped than any other generation before us. At the same time, let us say a uh, hundred or two hundred years ago, if uh, this sort of virus broke out in Wuhan, in China, uh, maybe ten, twenty, twenty-five, fifty people would have died and uh, that would be… that would have been the end of it in that village. But today, because we are so mobile that there is air travel and every day people are traveling across the world, because of this, it's gotten everywhere. So generally, the other type of uh, viruses that we have normally faced, generally plague and various other things, normally were carried by other carriers. So we had no control over it. But this one thing, we are the carriers. So this is a check on how consciously, how responsibly we are going to move around now. This is a real question on our lives. So it is both uh, a great advantage that we are the carriers and we can stop it. At the same time, it's a disadvantage because most human beings you could have killed the rats, you could have killed the mosquitoes, but you can't kill the human beings and they won't listen, they'll, all, they'll be all over the place. And our economic activity is also across the world, it is no more limited to agriculture or trading locally, but it's all over the world. Anything we have to do, we have to take it around the world. So because of this, it's become a challenge. Fortunately, unlike the previous ones, uh, I mean one that is in right now perspective is the Spanish flu of 1918. The mortality rate in this is much lower, but every day it is throwing up a, a new complication. Initially we thought it's just a respiratory thing and we will deal with it, but now we are seeing it's damaging liver, uh, neurological damage is happening, brain damage is happening, cardiac damage is happening. So it is getting more and more complex and we still do not know the exact nature of the virus itself. Uh, vaccination is far away because we have still not figured the entire range of what it can do. Every day they're coming up with new, uh, what to say, observations. Having said that, well, the biggest problem is now mort not… one thing is mortality, but mortality in India, the rate is not very high, we've managed it. If uh, it's kind of… Uh, it is bad because the doctors are dying and people who are in touch with uh, the disease consciously are uh, becoming victims. It is a challenge, but mortality rate is not very, very high. Eighty percent of the people who get infected with this virus may not show any symptoms, that's what they're saying. They may just live with it, nothing they will show. On this is also a problem because without any symptoms, they have the virus and these are the people who will carry it across the place because they don't even know they're carrying it. They won't cough, they won't sneeze, nothing happens, everything is fine, 
but they will be spreading the virus. That is the reason why it has spread the way it has spread, why the contagiousness of this particular virus is higher than what we have seen in the past is mainly because of this, the asymptomatic carriers are all over the place. You and me could have it, we don't know, we are healthy and we are well, we don't even think there's something wrong with us, but we could be spreading. So right now, what have we done? We have done absolutely nothing about the virus, we have just controlled human behavior a little bit with lockdown and uh, restrained it a little bit. But once the lockdown goes, how it will flare up, to what extent, how much damage it will cause to health and uh, medical infrastructure we have, whether it can take that kind of load and how many fatalities will happen out of this is anybody's guess. Because in a country like United States, already they've crossed 45,000 deaths. In uh, the density of population that we have in India is a different matter, but at the same time, Indians may have much stronger uh, immune system because they're exposed to many things normally and like for example, tuberculosis, which uh, is a very serious thing elsewhere, but almost ninety-five percent of the Indians won't pass the Mantos test. Almost all of us will show that we have some kind of tuberculosis bacilli within us, but we are not sick in any sense. So in this context, I feel that particularly the rural population in India is resilient. I don't think much fatalities will happen, but the disruption of economic activity, that is going to be the biggest challenge for us, because markets are being destroyed, many, many aspects of life where people need to come together will not happen, Well, agriculture may get on, you know, get going, but even for that, for, I, for example, right now, the vegetable growers and the fruit growers, this is mango season, I think nearly over sixty percent of the mangoes will rot this year because nobody is going to go and buy mangoes outside. Like this, the market shelves are destroyed because nobody is going to the market. And uh, yeah, textile is a huge thing in India. The, uh, you know, substantial number of people are engaged in textile industry. I don't think it will take off uh, in any, in, you know, in any near future. When I say near future, at least, for one year, I don't think, because people won't go and buy clothes when there is an economic uh, restraint. So many industries will take a big hit, every one of us. Well, <laughs> the government will take a big hit, the large businesses will take a hit, small businesses will take a hit, individual people will take a hit, institutions will take a hit. All of us are going to take a hit. So one of the biggest challenges right now is, in the last twenty years of economic activity and certain amount of liberalization and progress that happened, we raised about two hundred and fifty people out of poverty. But in the next year, we may be pushing them straight back below the poverty line, it's very much possible. But our… our ability to bounce back, I'm talking in economic terms, in terms of… Uh, the infection, in terms of what the virus will do to us, nobody has a clear picture. There is no clear picture anywhere, every day new, new observations are coming. But in terms of economy, if we have the virus reasonably under control, at least by September, if in India, at least by September, if we have that, then probably if we do all the smart things, to attract a huge amount of outside investments, because right now uh, Japan has put out over uh, five billion dollars to get their industry out of China. And America will definitely do similar things. At least three hundred companies will be looking for a new home, if not fully, at least partially. That new home must become India, all of you in business, in collaboration with the government, you must grab this because these twenty-eight states that we have, if we ensure a minimum of uh, ten big industries going to each one of these states, it will keep us buzzing and we can uh, in many ways uh, handle this. But I… Uh, please, uh, because you are the people who are in business, you should know better than me, but in my opinion, I feel without a huge amount of investment coming from outside, uh, we will be in a very dire situation. Those who are well-to-do may survive, businesses may go, people survive, but down below, 
the workers, the daily wages, uh, there will be a very serious situation. We could be pushing millions of people back into poverty unless we get a phenomenal amount of investment from outside. I don't think we can just kickstart everything inside the country because we need markets. The markets may not be coming back to normal in eighteen months, twelve to eighteen months time or even twenty-four months time. So this, these are hard times, but as you said, it's a kind of a war. But at least nobody is bombing our homes, nobody is shooting at us. It's the virus, if we behave responsibly, we can uh, survive through this and live through this. So one of the most fundamental things for the next month is all of us stay alive. That's the most important thing. If we think what we are doing is important, then the important thing is to stay alive and ensure people around us stay alive. This is the fundamental responsibility right now. And if we stay alive and strong, bouncing back will happen one way or the other. Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, in fact, your knowledge on economy, I'm surprised, is even much deeper. Uh, now we have Dr. Mahesh Gupta. He is our former president. He is also CMD uh, Kantaro, the water purifier. So over to Mahesh Gupta ji. Uh, Pranam Sadhguru, it's an honor for us to interact with you. The situation is very uncertain at this moment of time, as you have described it, and we also all understand. And we people in business have a great responsibility to understand the situation and move forward. Uh, your description saying that it will last till September, if we can take it up to September, then we can bounce back. Uh, that's one theory on the one side, which I totally subscribe to this. On the other side, we have a theory of China. Uh, in a three months time, they've been able to come back uh, to normal, by and large, a normal seat. So maybe if we can uh, do our lockup for a three months time, maybe we will achieve instead of uh, September to this uh, this present time. But anyway, in such uncertain situation in businesses, when we can see two extremes, a positive and negative, the mind goes towards the negative all the time. A lot of fear comes in the mind of business people. And we being leaders, they affect all the people working under us. So I like to have a pulse of wisdom that how to take care of this uncertain situation and fear in the mind of businesses. Thank you. Well, uh, the situation is bad enough, <laughs> so we don't have to suffer fear also. Uh, the economic situation is going to be bad enough, the challenges are uh, serious enough. So let us not also suffer our own fear, because this is something that you manufacture in your mind. What is the reality? It's tough reality, no question. So let's not make it worse by multiplying this in our mind. What fear means is, uh, essentially, we are uh, letting our imagina imagination run away into a future. Instead of creating the future, we are describing the future in negative terms and which causes enormous amount of fear. About what China has done, well, what China has done or what China has not done, uh, I don't think it's in our knowledge. And above all, it is a certain kind of uh, authority that when they want to do something, they can do something at any cost. I don't think you can do that in India. And uh, above all, people are already getting restless. May 3rd, they're all waiting, they're thinking they can burst out and do what they want. That's not how it's going to be. Some level of relaxation will happen, but still we have to maintain discipline in terms of uh, human distancing, has to happen. So having said that, there are… there are medical, uh, I know, scientific calculations that they are saying, instead of closing on 3rd of May, if we push it to 15th of May, by September we can be on top of it. But if we push it up to May 31st, the lockdown, very rigid lockdown, then we could be out of it by the end of June or mid-July. So, uh, this is easier said than done. I don't think the government of India can actually enforce this, enforce this on the people. People have gotten restless, people are running out of cash, people are running out of means to live. So, it is not possible to simply push the lockdown further, further. We can say certain things where people congregate in big numbers, these things you can avoid, but the nature of the virus is such, a handful of people is enough. If they're going around every day, they're infecting. They say on an average, 
A person who moves around in the city can infect up to four hundred people per day, one person. So those permutations, if you look at it, it's just crazy. So there is a challenge and we still not figured out how to handle it. So the businesses must focus on what are the alternatives for whatever we are doing right now, because many businesses that we are into right now may become irrelevant for a period of time, if not permanently. When something becomes irrelevant for two to three years and uh, will it again come back is a question that we cannot answer just like that. We don't know how it will take. For example, even schools. Maybe no parent will want to send their children to schools when the month of June comes, when uh, schools are supposed to start. If there is fear of infections, if there are deaths happening around, I don't think people will send their children, so what are we going to do? All those who are running schools may have to think completely differently. For you, sir, water, anyway we have to drink, so I think uh, you are on a little safer ground <laughs> than most other businesses. But fashion industry, textile, uh, entertainment, all these are going to take a very serious hit. Uh, water, we cannot go without water no matter what is happening. So I think you are doing fine, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, we have Gopal Jivraska, he is a former president and also a CMD of Salora International Limited. So over to you, Gopalji. Uh, Pranam, Guruji. Namaskar. I think it's a great honor and privilege to be interacting with you. Uh, in times of such trouble, we have choice to go to the elected representatives or the selected few like you. I think today not much solace is coming out of the elected. So I think we look forward to getting solace from the selected few like you. I think uh, people like you have great power to influence the heart and the mind like no elected person can do. Do you think enough interaction is happening by the lawmakers with the people at large and enough transparency is there to remove their anxiety? to make sure that they move towards the people with solution rather than people with problem. And my second question is that, uh, of course, you mentioned that we will need a lot of investment and maybe most of it has to come from outside. But I have one question, you know, there are so many religious institutions in India, I think who are sitting on lakhs of crores of rupees in cash or in kind. Don't you think this is the right time for all these people to open their chests and really put this money to use for mankind? I think for times like this is when for this money has been kept there and created. Thank you. Uh, let me answer the second question first uh, <laughs> because that is a very wrong notion because with the HRNC laws, that is uh, Hindu religious whatever, staff. All the temple lands, temple jewelry, temple money is already in the hands of government. This is an absurd thing that has happened in our country, that the money that you collect in a temple does not go to the temple or the development of the temple, it goes to the government. And the government is using it whichever way, just seeing it as a revenue. And uh, much damage has happened because they put government clerks out there, the… In, in the Hindu temples, most of the Hindu temples, there is no devotee who is worshipping uh, the deity. It is a government clerk appointed by the government. There is substantial evidence that at least fifteen percent of the South Indian temples, the main deity has been sold, has been sold and transported outside the country and they've replaced it with, with something else which looks similar. So. There is really no money in temples and religious institutions because it's already been taken by the government. If you're talking about major institutions like Tirupati, you must understand it belongs to the Andhra Pradesh government. The money is already going there. If you're talking about the Vatican, well, you won't get access to that. Nobody else really has any great amount of money. Well, Tiruvananthapuram, whatever, they have seized it. That's the only temple probably which escaped. Otherwise, British took charge of it and they took whatever they can in terms of gold and whatever. The land and whatever jewelry was remaining has been taken by our present governments. So I don't think they can help if they have any little money, that's not going to make a big difference. 
about uh, government giving you whether the policy makers can give you solace. I don't want the policy makers to give you solace, they're supposed to find solutions. And uh, as business also, you should not be looking for solace, you should look for solution. When I say solution, solace means something that you do in your mind. This is our business to do it within ourselves, how we keep ourselves. As I said earlier, when there is an external problem, isn't that the time when you need to be at your best? Isn't that the time when you need to be at your best? Your thought, your emotion, your energy works for you. So when we become fearful, when we become anxious and all this, this simply means because there is an outside problem, we turn our own faculties against ourselves. Let's not do that and let's not hope either the prime minister or the chief minister or somebody else will come and give us solace. They need not give us solace, that's not the reason why we elected them. Coming to the selected ones like me <laughs> well, this is the problem, I am also not here to give you solace, I am also here to give you a different type of solution. When I say a solution, solace means this, somebody will tell you, don't worry, everything will be okay. They've been telling you this for a long time, but whatever happens, happens. So right now, there are people who are trying to bring solace to themselves by saying this coronavirus is uh, God's way of teaching us a lesson, all the bad people will get it, I won't get it. That's not the way it works, <laughs> it'll get whoever gets exposed. The coronavirus has no discrimination of what kind of a character you are. It doesn't matter who you are, when it gets you, it gets you, that's it. So let us not look for solace. Solace is for people who are not interested in solutions, they just want to feel good. In the name of solace, people will go drink in the evening and they feel good. So in a way, solace is just this, a kind of a tranquilizer for yourself. This is not a time to tranquilize yourself, this is a time to be at your best, physically, mentally, in your competence, in your mind, in your energies, in your emotion, you must be at your best that will not happen out of solace. Solace means you will think everything is okay and go to sleep. Everything is not okay right now. Too many things are not okay. For we as a nation and the world, too many things are not okay. This is a time every one of us strived to find solutions in whatever areas of work we are in. In those areas we must find solutions. The government, the administration is trying to do its best, but with limited resources, there are many challenges. Well, the world is acknowledging that uh, we as a nation, we have handled it very well, this whole thing. Compared to many other Western nations, we have handled it very well, but still with such a complex mix of population and such a dense population, how will we handle it in the next three months is a huge challenge. But I feel once the lockdown ends, May 3rd is over. After that, this partial lockdown which may they try… which the government may try to do is going to be extremely difficult for any government to implement this partial lockdown. This can only be done by the citizens. Only by responsible behavior of the citizens, this can be achieved. No government can effectively do partial… this thing, they can… they can impose curfew and do total lockdown but they cannot do partial lockdown successfully. This partial lockdown can only happen out of absolute citizen participation and that is what they're trying to do. Uh, Prime Minister is giving a call for the youth of the nation, he's meeting the industry, he's meeting the spiritual leaders, he's meeting everybody to somehow get people's participation because without that, we will not succeed in partial lockdowns. Thank you, Sadhguru. Now we have uh, Mrs. Anuradha Ji, uh, she is chairman of our PhD Family Welfare Foundation. And this PhD Family Welfare Foundation is doing a great job by distributing food packets to the needy. So over to you, Anuradha Ji. Sadhguru Pranam, it has been a pleasure listening to you so far. Uh, Sadhguru Ji, we have skill development units spread over North India and in Delhi NCR. Now, uh, as at present, obviously, they are closed. 
we uh, look after our beneficiaries in a holistic manner and teach them skills uh, by which they earn a livelihood once they leave our center when once the center reopens what is the message of hope uh, we can give to our beneficiaries because they will be requiring a lot of hand holding once the centers reopen see as a nation if we look at ourselves as a nation for 1.4 billion people we don't have enough forest we don't have enough rivers and water bodies we don't have enough land we don't even have enough piece of sky for 1.4 billion people so the only real uh, wealth that we have is a uh, human potential or human resource that we have now if we have very skilled focused and inspired population well we can become a miracle but if we have unskilled unfocused uninspired population we will be the greatest disaster right now we are always uh, kind of many people are very proud that we are the youngest nation in the world <laughs> that is uh, nearly 50% of the population is below 35 years of age this advantage if we do not harness in the next 10 to 15 years time then you will have an older generation of people without any skills without any capabilities without any experience of work and that will be a major disaster so if we want to harness the potential of this nation we have just a window of 10 to 15 years time so skill development is a key element of our development so you must put that into them that they are not just earning a living they are building a nation this is far more important i'm telling you than even the freedom movement far more important thank you sadguru we have karan gelotra he is the chairman of our punjab state uh, chapter he is also md of platinum enterprises over to you mr karan gelotra uh, pranam sad sadguru ji uh, बहुत खुशकिस्मती आ रही है कि हम आपसे आज बात कर पा रहे हैं गुरुजी मैं आ, ये कोविड की बातें बहुत हो गई है मैं कुछ आ, और आपसे पूछना चाहता था वॉट एपन टू योर हेयर इज नॉट वायरस राइट आई थिंक दैट गुरु जी आई फील एवरी वन हैज अर्पज इन लाइफ or uh, i feel mine is to help people and i love doing that to the best of my ability and i also do it from my heart but on the flip side i love to drink i smoke i eat meat also and i love to socialize i love the company of my friends do uh, do these habits uh, guruji define me as a sinner oh <laughs> you helping somebody is not a virtue you drinking and eating meat is not a sin it is just you have to look at it in terms of is it sensible for your life to do certain things does it add in any way to your life well most human beings are doing most of the things they do thinking that it will get them something well nothing gets you anything because <laughs> now virus is hanging in our face and reminding i have been trying to remind people nearly for the last 40 years but i think this virus is doing the teaching much better than me that suddenly everybody is aware they are mortal this is something we must understand mortal means we have a limited amount of time that's all it means how old are you sir i'm 43 sir 43 45 years ago you were dead hello yes you are not alive 45 years ago you were dead i will give you another 60 years hmm 103 years is good or you want more <laughs> no, no. <laughs> i i don't want that much sir no 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 it's okay you can uh, you can still drink and eat whatever and live to 103 years of age so i'll give you another 60 years after 60 years again you will be dead for how long were you dead 45 years ago endless amount of time how long will you be dead after 60 years endless amount of time you're just alive for a brief period of time in this period of time what makes at most sense to you that's what you must do because it's a very brief amount of time 
Because people are spending their life unconsciously, not paying attention, as you sit here, life is ticking away. Because people are not conscious of this, they think they can do all kinds of things which don't mean a damn thing to them. No, no, I enjoy what I'm doing. Yes, maybe. But why don't you also explore other dimensions of life, how it would feel? <laughs> See, look at my eyes, I look always uh, stoned. Never touched any of the substances that you're talking about. But isn't this human body, this human mechanism, the most sophisticated chemical factory on the planet? Do you agree with me, Karan? Absolutely, sir. <laughs> So, when this is such a fantastic chemical factory, most refined and sophisticated chemical manufacturing unit, well, they are saying uh, some trillions of functions are happening per minute. Now the question, the only choice that you have is, either you are a wonderful, effective CEO or you are a lousy CEO. If you are a really good manager of things, you would make… if you sit here, you would make yourself feel absolutely fantastic because every human experience has a chemical basis to it. So you create the most wonderful chemistry, you sit here and you're ecstatic. Would you want to drink alcohol, take a drug, do something? Because as you sit here, you're feeling fantastic, why would you do that? So I'm saying you have a tremendous opportunity right here. Just explore and see, I'm not saying give up anything. Just explore and see, if you find something better, smaller things will fall off by themselves. Thank you, Sadhguru. Thank you, thank you Guruji. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Sanjay Agrawal, he's senior vice president, PhD Chamber of Commerce. He's also chairman and managing director of Paramount Communication Limited. Over to you, Sanjay Ji. Sadhguru Pranam, Namaskar. as uh, we are all uh, businessmen, we are all uh, leaders uh, of our companies, uh, so we are responsible not only to our families but to our employees, not only our employees but even to our other stakeholders including our, uh, our vendors, our customers and a lot of uh, ecosystem that we are a part of. Uh, in this situation, what we are finding is that uh, we are having a responsibility stuff, uh, struck upon us which uh, we may like to carry, but uh, the burden might not be, you know, we uh, would probably be beyond our capabilities in most businesses, which is to keep on bearing the expenses of keeping a business alive, paying the full salaries of people when uh, the, there is no revenue coming. So it might even become physically uh, no, not no, unfeasible for us to, to go ahead. How do we get our burden to the government, to the powers that be? that if they are collecting taxes from us, if uh, they are the people, they are the institution which has the maximum command over the country, then they have to uh, put in, uh, do much more than they expect what uh, an individual businessman can do. What would be your view on that, uh, Sadhguru? Well, uh, in the next few months or fortunately, uh, hopefully it will be only a few months or in the next couple of years, one of the most painful decisions and actions that all of us may have to take is that people we are concerned about, people that we would like to take care of, we may not be able to take care of them and we have to decide that we will not take care of them. This is going to be the most painful decisions that we will have to make. Already they are making such decisions in the hospitals, not happened yet in India, our hospitals are still not overloaded. But in Italy and in United States, they're inundated and they're making these decisions. Like if… Uh, if you and your mother are in the hospital in the same ward, there's only one ventilator, who should get it? They're taking lottery in some… in some uh, countries. Others are deciding on the age basis, younger person gets the ventilator, older person doesn't get it. How hard a decision is that? So, unfortunately, we are at times where we will be forced to take very painful decisions, things that we want to take care of, things that we genuinely care about and concerned about, not being able to, able to take care of it will always be the most painful thing that, man, you know, a human being can do. So, this is… this is in front of us, we cannot close our eyes, we cannot play ostrich with this. 
it is in front of us, we have to deal with this about government doing more. Well, on the ground till now, I think they have done excellent. I have to tell you this, this may be difficult for people to digest. From what I am seeing here in Tamil Nadu and various other states, our volunteers are on the ground, sir, doing variety of service in terms of food and whatever else. I find the ministers, the bureaucrats, the police officials, the level of… and of course the medical personnel, the level of commitment and dedication with which they are functioning, if they function like this for the next five years, we will be a different nation altogether. It is truly fantastic how focused and how committed they are day and night, they are taking care of things. So these things are being done, I'm… I'm sure you are talking in terms of can they do more for the business. Well, our GDP, the way it is, it is… it is not a substantial GDP for 1.4 billion people. We don't have a big enough GDP for 1.4 billion people and uh, no government I think is capable of really, you know, making sure everybody gets everything for the next one year without working and without being productive. And even if you're productive, if there is no market, there is no money, these are serious challenges. Well, infusion of money and liquidity has to happen, otherwise uh, businesses and industry could get wiped out. Uh, I'm sure they're conscious of it, it is being worked out and also industry and specific businesses, whatever the areas of businesses, much… must make strong representation because… <laughs> because when their resource is limited, whoever cries loudest will get better kind of uh, attention. Unfortunately, that is the reality. But we are not that kind of an economy where United States is pumping in two trillion dollars straight away. Uh, we are not in that kind of a state to pump in that kind of money. That's why I said bringing in forest, foreign uh, investment in a big way. If in the next one year we focus on bringing in at least a trillion dollars of investment, then we will breathe. Otherwise, even if we are not infected by corona, we will still choke in many different ways. Uh, these are very hard times, these are not easy times. Still the hardest part is yet to come. Right now, lockdown itself, people are complaining. You will see when you relax the lockdown, that is when the difficulties will come. Only… only uh, hope and uh, uh, this, uh, you know, something that's giving us hope and strength about this is, most probably in India, it may not run right as it did in the Western countries, simply because the nature of our culture, our food, our connection with the land, we are just one generation away from farming, so there is a different kind of resilience in our bodies. We may pass through this little better, but it's only a hope. There is no evidence, there is no hundred percent guarantee about it, but some of the indicators are showing that we may come out of it better because the fatality rates are pretty low in India right now. Uh, we must understand, I think we have identified some three lakh people as positive, is it? Uh, whatever number, I think fifty thousand or… In India. So, uh, this is simply because we just not able to test too many people. There is no way we're going to test one billion people, it's uh, not even a practical uh, possibility. So, there are a whole lot of people who have infections, but they're not even sick, they're not going to the hospital, they're… they don't even know they're carrying it. That is a danger, at the same time that's a good sign. That means many of us may go through the infection without any great damage to our systems. Uh, that is our biggest hope. Hope Indian uh, genetics and body and food makes us little more resilient that we can pass through, otherwise we're definitely hitting a pit uh, that we must right now plan and strategize how to get out of in the next uh, twelve months. Thank you, Sadhguru. Now we have Sake Dalbia, the young and dynamic uh, uh, leader. Uh, he's also a mentor of uh, Young Business Leader Forum of uh, PSD Chamber, also chairman of our PSD Retail Committee. He's MD PG Industries Limited. Over to you, Mr. Sake. Thank you, Agarwal. Please be very brief. Yeah. I'll try to be. Pranam Sadhguruji. Uh, my question today is a bit personal. 
uh, when the lockdown started, there was an initial feeling of despair. All the things around me were feeling that all businesses are coming down, and suddenly the whole ecosystem started falling. After that initial phase, when I started uh, internalizing my time to my family, suddenly I started having more time. I could enjoy the love and affection of my parents, my family, and I was in a state of happiness. That emotional feeling of happiness was no more. Connected to my uh, business efforts and everyday rewards. So don't tell me you don't want to come out of the lock lo lockdown. The question is, uh, Sadhguruji, that how to keep this feeling of happiness which I have attained right now going ahead in my life? <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. You had some good time with the family, but uh, we need to understand this that human experience is essentially caused from within us. Whether it's joy or misery, whether it is pain or pleasure, whether it's agony or ecstasy, whatever is the human experience happens from within us. What happens within us, we are trying to create it by creating <laughs> external circumstances. We must understand this, no matter who we are, how capable and competent we are, at no point is external circumstance one hundred percent the way we want it, that'll never happen. So always, because outside situations will never happen hundred percent the way we want it, and whenever things don't happen the way you want it, if you're going to become miserable, then naturally, unknowingly, you will curtail the scope and, uh, you know, scope and dimension of your life itself, because you always try to be in safe zone. Safe zone means constipated life, that's all it is. You will restrict it because if you step into something unmanageable, you will get into trouble or you will become unhappy. So this is what you have to first fix, that your way of being is not determined by what's happening around you. A wonderful family that you may have should not determine that, successful business that you have should not determine that. What is happening within you must be determined by you. You are feeling joyful right now, it must be your making. Now if you are with your family, you will share your joy with them. You are not trying to get joy from them. If you are in business, there also you are trying to do your best as an expression of the fulfillment that you have in your life. But right now, we are trying to squeeze these things. What happens within us, we are trying to get it from outside. Right now is mango season. I see you have a nice tree, it's not a mango tree but you have a in a very beautiful tree in the background. But suppose it was a mango tree, you want mangoes, should you go and look up at the tree or you start digging at the roots to find mangoes? You won't find mangoes there. So right now this is what is happening, happiness or misery. Whatever human experience happens within you, what happens within you must happen the way you want it. So this is why inner engineering, we… when I continuously been going on for forty years telling people, all first thing you have to do before you touch the world, before you touch anybody else's life, first thing is you must make this life pleasant. Otherwise, you may do it with best intentions, but you will cause unnecessary nonsense in the world simply because when you are feeling miserable, you will one way or the other become nasty to life around you. When you are feeling wonderful, you are always wonderful to everybody. Just tell me this, is this not true with you and everybody? If I meet you when you're very happy, you are a wonderful man, I am no… I have no question about that. But if I meet you when you're frustrated, angry, miserable about something, you could be nasty, isn't it? This is true with you, this is true with everybody. So this is the first thing you must fix. You are joyful, you are happy right now, but let it not be because of your family. You are joyful because you have made that happen within yourself. Now your family time is to share this joy that you have with them. Tomorrow you step out into the business, once again your life is an expression of this joy. Now you will do life in a completely different way. First thing is we must engineer ourselves, then touch the world, otherwise uh, we will mess it up with good intentions. Thank you, Sadhguru. As we are running short, this is going to be the last question from Mr. Rajiv Rutra. He is professional member of PhD chamber. 
his managing partner LNN Partners. Mr. Raju Rutra, over to you. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. <laughs> uh, Tell me. Vedma, Vedma and the family sends you a lot of warm namaskarams. We are very, very blessed, uh, Sadhguru, that uh, we have been able to talk to you. And I have heard you on many, many sessions, and each time I've learned something new. My question to you, uh, Sadhguru, is you've been answering many, many tough questions. And I, you know, think if I was sitting in your place, how would I answer them? And a lot of them you've taken really, uh, you know, you've answered them well, people have heard well, and people have learned well. And we are all best that we've got a lot of solutions. So my question is, what was the toughest question you were asked? And what was your answer? <laughs> uh, I'm waiting for that question. It's not come yet. <laughs> Great, Sadhguru. And by the way, Sadhguru, uh, Adi Yogi awaits. Let this finish, you have to come and bless it. <laughs> well, how, you, Sadhguru. how did they allow you on a membership uh, for this? Uh, what is this progress? What is this? I'm sorry. PhD Chamber of Commerce. Ah, how did they allow you on this, Raj? Sadhguru, even their committees make mistakes. <laughs> 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 Wonderful Thank you, seeing Sadhguru. you. Long time. <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguru. This was a lifetime opportunity to hear your words of wisdom. I would request Mr. Sanjay Agrawal to uh, propose a formal word of thanks. Oh, Gurudev, it's my absolute privilege uh, to have uh, felt uh, this uh, closeness to you and to, uh, to hear from you in person uh, today uh, from in such a wide-ranging uh, discussion that we had. I think uh, you have told us your uh, very, very clear and unambigu unambiguous views, starting from social and commercial to practical to spiritual to even existential. I think you have covered the whole gamut and tried to, uh, you know, uh, not tried to, uh, you successfully done it, sir, to, uh, to actually give us uh, the gyan that we need in these uh, challenging times, which was the focus of our talk today. I am very, very grateful to you, uh, Gurudev, and we keep, uh, we, we hope that we keep having more and more sessions with you uh, so that the chamber, P the PhD chamber and its members keep benefiting from your sage advice. Pranam Gurudev. Namaskaram. May the best be with you. My blessings to all of you. Thank you very much.